Welcome everyone. I'm Wilma Hodges. I'll be moderating this session. Um, this session is Zoom Online Teaching and Opencast um, presented by Greg Logan. And um, I just have a couple of housekeeping details first. Uh, so please uh, be sure to leave yourselves muted and your cameras off during the presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, please wait until the question and answer portion of the presentation, or you can use the shared notes in the left above the user list to type your question in there at any point during the, the presentation. Please uh, try to use the chat box only for chat, not for questions. That way we can find the questions a little bit easier. And if you have any technical issues, please let send me a direct message. Um, my name is Wilma Hodges over in the left hand side. You can direct message me and I'll try to assist you if I can. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Greg. All right. Thank you, William. I'm, uh, I'm Greg Logan and I am here to talk to you today about a project I did for one of our major adopters and gluing everything together. So quick little bit of quick background about me. Um, I'm one of the original developers that was working on Opencast. It's been 11 years now, which time flies when you're having fun. It really doesn't feel like that long. Um, for the last few years, I've actually been an independent consultant. My primary gig has been the QA slash community coordinator role within the Opencast project. Um, but I've also been doing side projects of which this is one of them. I have worked in the last 11 years um, for multiple of our major adopters, either full or part-time, most of the time part-time, but you know, um, it works out really well. So that's sort of me. Let's talk about Opencast. So for those of you who aren't aware, Opencast is a uh, video management and delivery system. You feed in usually large high bitrate media, although it doesn't have to be large high bitrate media, it can be whatever you want. Um, from basically whatever you want. Um, traditionally, <laughs> in the before times, we used um, fixed classroom infrastructure. So large cameras, or um, in the case of some of our adopters, they actually had camera crews in the classrooms pointing at things. But it could be things like Opencast Studio, which uh, was talked about in one of the lightning talks yesterday. It's a web-based, uses your webcam and whatever microphone you happen to have lying around. Um, so there's that that works well. That's one of our recent oh, sorry, one of our recent features. You can also manually ingest from any other source. So if you've got some video that you've downloaded from somewhere and you want to put it in Opencast, you can do that, given that your user has the right permissions. Opencast then takes that input um, and enriches it. So enrich in Opencast has a, a sort of an overloaded meaning because there's a ton of different things that it, that we can do or that is done automatically by Opencast. So some of this is things like automated segmentation. So like detecting where the slide um, divisions are in a video. Automated transcription, sorry, my cat is trying to climb up on me. Automated transcription of um, the, the audio. So if your faculty is talking about TVs, then it all of a sudden you've got captioning data about um, the, whatever the faculty member is talking about. Uh, compositing, so taking different videos and um, sticking them side by side, that kind of thing. We have a basic editing suite built into the UI. It's not hugely advanced. It's not a full nonlinear editor by any means, but it's usually enough to do things like clip off the beginning and end of a video to remove, you know, the part, that awkward part of the video where the faculty member is, hits the start button, sits, composes themselves, and then starts talking, right? You don't want that initial part. The editor can remove that kind of thing. Um, and then after all of this processing, it outputs to basically whatever you want. Um, traditionally, our adopters use the Opencast video system. Like it, we have a built-in media portal. Um, and that's where most of our adopters um, publish their stuff, but some of them publish to YouTube, some of them publish to um, AWS S3 CloudFront. Yeah, CloudFront. There's too many cloud somethings. Um, most of our adopters, even though if they do publish to Opencast's video portal itself, integrate with, with LTI um, to whatever their LMS is, um, whether most of them are using uh, the name is escaping me, Strude IP, 
Um, but I mean, it will work with anything because it's LTI. All right, so this project was sponsored by ETH Zurich. Um, they are a large existing Opencast install and they love their metadata. They have more metadata than they know what to do with as far as I can tell. Um, and they archive their videos effectively indefinitely. Um, they, as far as I know, don't ever delete anything. And that's really cool because it, it, prevents, it presents um, an interesting challenge for Opencast to keep track of all of this metadata and to keep track of all the videos so that you know they, nothing gets lost. Primarily prior to COVID, um, they were an in-person inst institution. There was, I think, a little bit of e-learning going on, but it wasn't really, it was a secondary role for sure. Um, obviously with COVID, they had to transition rapidly to online. Uh, and for this, they chose Zoom. And that presented an issue because they still wanted to do record everything. And Zoom has cloud recording, but it's extremely expensive. Um, even with the, like, I'm a large institution um, deals that that can get cut if you're a large enough institution, Zoom's cloud recording stuff is still extremely expensive. And obviously it's also not archived within their OpenCast system, which is something that they actually really cared about. So they approached me to build them some glue to go from Zoom to uh, OpenCast. So let's talk a little bit about Zoom. I don't know, you, you may or may not have used Zoom before. Um, Zoom's ability to search through their cloud recordings, I think is really not very good. Um, the recordings disappear from, like if you look at your user's set of recordings, they disappear after I think a week or two, which might not sound like much, but a lot of their, a lot of ETH's students would go back at the end of term and want to be able to rewatch a big chunk of those lectures. And that, that's not really all that useful if they disappear, right? There's also no easy way to search for another user's recording. And I'll get to that in a little bit, why that's actually important. There's also no way to search by title, only date, and only within a given user's silo. So to find Professor X's video, you have to A, find Professor X, and then also know what the date of the video is, which isn't really all that useful for a lot of students. Uh, and my question would be, how acceptable would that be for your faculty, especially when the, that faculty is used to a good search tool with a whole bunch of metadata and all kinds of stuff, right? To, to go back to name and date and that's it. it. It's not an acceptable video portal. And that, I mean, it's not designed to be. Zoom's stuff is not designed to be a media portal. So that's not really surprised that it's not acceptable. So, um, Ingesting Zoom recordings was now a priority. Uh, so ETH started exploring what they what the options were. And there weren't really any, of course, because Zoom was on the up and coming at that point. It wasn't the, the dominant <laughs> video meeting system, uh, commercial video meeting system. Apologies, big blue button. Um, so they went searching inside the community and outside the community, and they found that Harvard DCE had implemented an AWS-based Zoom ingest tool, which was fine, except that Harvard's OpenCast install runs entirely within AWS. So they can take some shortcuts, which leverage AWS's extensive set of magical tooling. Um, they've got, in this case, Harvard's um, downloading tool is using Lambda and uh, their AWS's queuing system and things that ETH did not want to do. So they actually contracted me to start work on this. And then about two weeks into development, we discovered that S Systems, another um, uh, consultancy within the OpenCast sort of sphere, had already started. Um, <laughs> this was not ideal. This is basically the same project, but it was being funded by two different institutions and duplicating the work. And that this is something that it's not really part of this talk, but if you are part of an open source group or an adopt or you are an adopter of an open source or open source group rather, and you're commissioning work, talk to your community. Because we like, I'm I'm on the board. I'm probably the lead developer in OpenCast. Not that that actually means anything in OpenCast, but my it's my name on the GitHub repo. Um, and I had no idea that S Systems was working on this at all. Had I known that, I would have reached out to them and we could have worked together. But 
at that point, S Systems had already run out of money because they had only been um, only been contracted for a prototype. So, if you are in an open source community and you're commissioning work, please talk to the rest of the community because there's really no point in duplicating effort. Anyway, back to the talk. Um, so, S Systems had built this prototype. And then we found out that they had done that. I was just at the beginning of the prototyping stage. So we had a chat and S Systems was happy to release their code to me. And then I extended it extensively and moved forward with a non-cloud implementation. So this is something that runs entirely on premises. There's no um, magical AWS queuing systems or anything like that. It runs entirely on your hardware because that's how ETH wants to run their OpenCast install. So what were the goals here? This has all been sort of backstory. What exactly was I, was I trying to do? Um, they wanted it to be as automated as possible. Their admin UI or their non-admin users do not see a UI ever. And they've got, I think, two, uh, blah, two admin users total. Um, so this needed to be very hands-off in terms of their workload. They needed to use the meeting name to detect course ID. So in Zoom, you can set a meeting name. It might be meeting topic, I'm not sure. The Zoom's APIs, Zoom's API refers to it as the meeting topic. It might be the meeting name in the UI. I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head. Um, but ETH basically said, if it starts with their course code, so VVZ dash whatever, that I could use that um, tag basically to detect which course this recording belonged to and where it should go inside of OpenCast. And then once the meeting finishes, this system should automatically trigger ingestion to OpenCast using a preset workflow. So they were happy with like every single Zoom recording gets this workflow run on it, just put it in the right place. So that's what we did. And then events which do not match that filter should be sent to a catch-all course and then manually triaged from, from there. So, I mean, there's always gonna be somebody who fat fingers it or just didn't read the instructions and didn't name their class right. And that's where the admin person comes in. They have to actually look at these and go, this is so-and-so or this isn't supposed to be recorded at all, that kind of thing. And then there needed to be a manual search by some combination of user title and date to manually ingest things. So if something went wrong, they needed to be able to manually trigger ingests. Um, and with that also came the ability to override what would be otherwise be used um, in terms of metadata. So if they wanted to change the name of the faculty member, um, and this is something that I'll talk about in a second, um, if they want to change the name of the faculty member coming in, they can do that. So, Let's talk about how how we use Zoom. Um, Zoom, event, Zoom events, um, when they finish, at least in the way that I've got this set up, they can trigger what's called a webhook. So it posts, it sends a uh, web request to op or ETH's servers to trigger the ingest, um, which is great. That's that's perfect. That's exactly what they want. Except it's sort of like a fire hose. It gets everything. There's no way of filtering out which events trigger things. So things like non-class recordings, and this actually came up where things like university board meetings were being ingested to OpenCast, and that is explicitly not what they want. Um, so that kind of thing had to be filtered out. Things like students being given permission to create their own um, ad hoc classrooms and then recording them, that's fine. That's great, but it's not something that should go into the official um, or official university-wide portal. There's also things like test recordings. Um, I, they found that a lot of their staff would sign in five minutes early and practice, make a like two-minute recording of, hello, my name is blah, blah, blah. This is checking the audio levels. That's great. That's what they want, but they also don't want those being posted to the classroom um, basically posted to the classroom's wall. So that kind of thing needed to be filtered out. Um, there was also the fun part of who schedules, and I just realized that that's, there's an apostrophe in there that's not supposed to be there. Who schedules your faculty's Zoom meetings? Um, so at least with ETH, a lot of the Zoom meetings, the classes, 
weren't actually scheduled by the faculty member. They were scheduled by a TA or somebody else, somebody who is not the correct person to publish the recording as. Um, so that kind of thing needed to be either filtered or fixed uh, on the fly. So we did that. And then also how accurate is the metadata? Um, so at the beginning, when they first started, when ETH first started having these recordings done, they told people, told their faculty that they needed to be tagged with the course ID. So VVZ dash whatever. Um, and initially it wasn't very good because people forgot or fat fingered it or whatever. They didn't understand the format. Um, but to avoid the metadata overload burden that um, we talked about in the plenary, I think that was yesterday, um, they put the burden on the schedulers. So your your TA or your faculty member needed to get that right or else their video just didn't get published in the right place. And that pretty rapidly led to really good adherence in terms of getting the names right so that people, so that the triage was minimized and that minimizes staffing costs and that's makes everyone happy, right? So um, overall, the implementation actually wasn't that bad. I mean, there's a lot of sort of logic in it, but the overall structure is pretty easy. Events come in, uh, if they pass the filter or they're manually triggered, they get put into a queue and then one or more workers, and this system supports as many workers as you want, although I think ETH is running with one and it's perfectly fine, um, pulls from the queue, downloads the file of from Zoom, so it's a fairly large video file, and then ingests it to OpenCast. And then it also records the Zoom ID and OpenCast ID so that you know if something goes wrong, um, they can figure out which where a video ended up if it ends up in the wrong place. Um, this is all implemented in Python, and it, it's not public yet, but it will be soon. Um, I was just finishing up some bugs, and it's finally ready to go, so should be good to go soon. Um, this Right now, it's built around Zoom uh, and OpenCast, but realistically, there's no, no strong reason that it has to be Zoom specifically. It would be fairly easy to swap this out for, say, Teams or any of the other major... Um, video meeting systems that are out there. Um, so like that's all well and good. What, what's the point of this talk? Um, the point is that Zoom is really expensive and Zoom effectively holds your data hostage if you leave it there, right? I mean, you put it there and as long as you keep paying them, they'll leave it there. But as soon as you stop paying them and that's a fairly large amount of money, uh, it goes away. And that's not something you necessarily want as a university. Your institution, it should be your data. Open source, open source software in this case means that we can pivot quickly. Um, this whole thing was developed by effectively one guy over the course of, I think it was two and a half months, something like that. And it means that small teams can make a big impact, right? I mean, this is a major university that couldn't archive their stuff until I got this done. So pull requests are always welcome because when you're in open source, you, you want to work with the community. You don't want to have to wait for your vendor to get up off their butt and do things. You want to be able to do it yourself. And that's where open source comes in. Also means you can deliver it how you want it. Um, I don't know if Zoom was charging ETH for transit. Like if, if people were streaming video from, ETH, from Zoom, did ETH get charged for that? I don't know, but there's certainly ways to do it cheaper than Zoom is probably, um, especially if they're marking it up, which I'm sure they would be. Um, and it also means that you can deliver it offline. You can make the video downloadable as a podcast type thing. You can make the video downloadable as a streaming thing where it's well protected and impossible to copy. It also lets you get some accessible things in there. Um, I think Zoom has some closed captioning but I imagine it's not cheap. OpenCast does that automatically. We have an automatic captioning generation system where it takes the, sound, takes the incoming audio and can make captioning data out of it. And that captioning data is searchable. So if your um, hearing impaired student goes and searches for uh, something that is in the captioning data, but isn't really in the title of the videos, they'll still find it. And that's something that can make a big difference to, um, especially 
uh, special needs students, students who don't have the same faculties that uh, everyone else does. And then the other thing is that OpenCast doesn't lock you in. Um, if you change your mind about OpenCast, you've got you know terabytes and terabytes of video in OpenCast, export it. Or just let it sit in OpenCast and let OpenCast sit in the corner and get to it, copy it out as you need it. There aren't any licensing fees in OpenCast. And aside from whatever costs you might have in terms of keeping the, the hard drive spinning and that kind of thing, we don't charge you. You get the system for free and you can change it however you want and add to it and be part of the community. And if you want to leave the community, that's fine too. We'll help you with that. And that's something that, especially with some of the other vendors that are out there, well, that doesn't always go so well. So that's sort of my, my talk about um, OpenCast and, and Zoom and how we've glued things together and how that glue can be significantly cheaper because you're not waiting for your vendor um, and significantly faster, again, because you're not waiting for your vendor to, uh, to build. So I think that was, yeah, I was about 20 minutes pretty much on the nose. So that's pretty good. Any questions, comments? I'm not seeing any questions in the shared notes, but if anybody has a question that they'd like to enter in there, or you can also use the chat at this point, um, since we're taking chat questions in general. Or questions about OpenCast as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it looks like you were sufficiently thorough that nobody has any questions. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for sharing this information. Hopefully that's given folks um, some, you know, reasons to consider alternatives to Zoom and other um, similar types of commercial products. So um, I, I don't know if these slides are available on the site. If, um, if you uploaded them, then people will be able to get to them afterward if they have a question. Um, and there's also the discussions in uh, the Trisakai site if you want to pose a question after the fact. Um, so I think, let me just look at the schedule really quick here. Um, I believe we have one more set of lightning talks. Yes, the last set of lightning talks is coming up at 12.55. So about um, 10 minutes or so from now. Uh, so that will be the, the last um, general session. Um, we are having a happy hour in um, something called Gather Town. So if you're interested in socializing with fellow attendees, um, that's happening at 1.45 following the lightning talks. And then um, later in the week, um, tomorrow and Friday, there's are a couple of additional uh, workshops. So tomorrow, I think there's an open source um, health factors workshop in the morning. And there's also some new portal workshops happening on Thursday and Friday. So um, I do encourage you guys to check out some of that content if you're interested. And uh, hopefully we will see you over in the lightning talks in just a few minutes. So thanks again, Greg. Thank you. See you all later.